I'm JP Mangalindan. I'm a writer with Fortune. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this panel about cybersecurity, but sort of threat assessment. And uh, with us today, we have Jeff Moss, AKA Dark Tangent, Chief Security Officer of <laughs> ICANN. Um, we, have John, we have John Herring, the CEO and co-founder of Lookout. We have Joseph Ancinelli, the a partner at Greylock. And then we have uh, John Stewart from Cisco. Thanks for joining us. Um, so the topic we're gonna to talk about today is one that I think is on a lot of people's minds, that being privacy and security in this digital era. Um, certainly no organization or individual is impervious. You know, just last week, Apple's developer site was hacked. Um, so for many, it's a concern. Um, to sort of get things started, I'd love to hear from you guys on a corporate or an individual level, what kind of threats do you see on the rise? <laughs> who wants it? Who no wants to go first. Yeah. Well, then. Yeah, that's... Jeff, you can Jeff, start. Jeff, you want to go first? Sure, I'll start. I, you know, I don't say any one thing is on the rise. It's sort of like the temperature's just been slowly turned up. And as an organ as a industry, I guess, it's very rare for us to ever kill a bug, kill something dead. I mean, when was the last security problem where we just put a spike in it and we're done? Like nothing. We still have cross-site scripting problems and SQL injection. And, Still have firewall problems. I mean, it's amazing. We only seem to add problems to our plate. It's very rare for us to ever get rid of them. And when we do, it's because we stopped using Windows 98. You know, it's not that we solved the problem. It's just we've moved on. We've run so fast that we've left our problems behind us. We haven't really solved them. So if I look forward, it's, it's mobile, right? That's, you can't speak on your phone securely because all the mobile, you can listen in on all the phone calls. You can intercept all the SMS, SMS calls. Um, the operating systems are not hardened enough. And so, and just recently, I think uh, Carson Knowles released an exploit where the last bit of the cell phone that was sort of sacrosanct was the SIM card. If I travel into China and I turn on my phone, China Telecom cannot reprogram my SIM card. Only AT&T can do that, because AT&T has like the digital signature for my SIM card. No other provider does. So at least I'm good. Now. Not anymore, right? Now anybody can reprogram pretty much anybody else's SIM card, execute stuff in the SIM card, have a backdoor in the SIM card, and that's the world we're living in, right? So the future is we're putting more and more in mobile, and everything about mobile, unfortunately, is kind of wide open. And so I try to tell CEOs, listen, mobile's great. Just know anything you say over that thing is probably listening to or could be listening to. There's a story, John knows some of the guys, a couple years ago, some crazy Germans put up an antenna in Berlin, just a high omnidirectional antenna, and they record half of the phone calls in Berlin with one antenna and about $5,000 of equipment. They record every conversation, every SMS message, and then they post-process it later on if they want. So if they run into you and they get your phone number from your business card and they're like, oh, I wonder what Jeff's been talking about. They can put in the number, decrypt all my conversations, and that's like some bored college students with 10 grand of gear. <laughs> so it's super easy to do. Well, imagine what's happening on Wall Street, right? So I would say that's a risk that people don't fully appreciate. It seems very esoteric and very theoretical until you see somebody sitting there doing it. Mm. Like, so now my conversations with my mom are like, how are you doing? OK, I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> Nothing too specific. Well, John, I'd love to hear what you think briefly. I don't want to. I don't want to linger too much on mobile because certainly yeah. security concerns pervade you know, the corporate level, the government, and so forth. But, but Lookout focuses for now on, on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your perspective. I mean, we think about solving problems for people. And when you think about where the attacks are migrating, to your point, attacks migrate to where usage exists. And computing at a fundamental le level is really migrating to mobile devices. And it doesn't matter you're, if you're an individual, if you're in an enterprise context, or if you're a government user. And what's very interesting is we're seeing a lot of the traditional threats that existed on the web migrate from a desktop web experience to a mobile web experience, like phishing. But then we're also seeing new variants of attacks as well, like the SIM card attack that Jeff's talking about. And even more so, a lot of kind of bespoke zero-day attacks against specific operating systems like iOS or Android that are very, very powerful and very, very hard to respond to. So we have this interesting spectrum where we're seeing very sophisticated attacks <coughs> that enable um, basically complete control over a device, remote exploitation, if you will. But it's very expensive to actually perform those attacks. On the other hand, probably the, the, the greatest area of growth that we're seeing in terms of attacks right now is uh, and especially on the Android platforms, in terms of 
malware attacks that are actually charging people's cell phone bill using the mobile operator as a proxy to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. like, Chargeware? It's called. Exactly right. And we have examples of, of organizations in Russia that are making $10, $20 million a month off Chargeware. I mean, this is a serious business. And uh, when, you, when you combine this <laughs> massive usage, low friction of proliferation, and a direct line to monetization, it's like the perfect storm, especially for cyber criminal activity. Well, you know, that sort of brings me, to, brings me to my next question. You know, we're seeing this increasing trend of people wanting to bring their personal devices into the workplace, bring your own device. Um, to that end, I mean, how, how, can, how can the employer sort of control that experience and, and keep, the, keep that information secure and private? I think it's a challenge. I mean, there's a lot of different companies and technologies trying to solve that problem. But in a world where, you know, uh, you have something that's more obvious where you're using, uh, you know, a file sharing application and all the information gets shared, you know, from a corporate perspective into, into an area where it's not controlled. That could be a problem, but that's a super solvable problem. On the other hand, and we've seen examples of this, especially in the mobile ecosystem, you have applications that gain access to parts of the operating system. So like contacts, for example, call history, browser history, and are just shuttling off all that information. And an example I use pretty commonly is there was an app we had found um, maybe a year or so ago, a little bit more, that was a My Little Pony wallpaper app. Maybe some of the people in this room have it on their phone. 4.4 .4 million people downloaded this, and it was grabbing your IMEI, IMSI, and voicemail number and password and sending it to a server in China. And we thought, OK, this is probably malware. And we were able to reverse engineer it, and we found it was not. And we got in touch with the developer. And we said, hey, why are you doing this? And he said, oh, no, this is obvious. This is how I make money. I sell all this information. And, and, and so there are applications that you may have downloaded on your phone that are grabbing information. And, and I'm guessing, like most of the people at this conference have very high value contact lists, for example, uh, or very sensitive information. Having that shuttled off to a random server where you don't know what's being done with that information. Or who buys it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That, that's a real but problem. But if you lose your phone, you just contact them and you get all your stuff back. <laughs> right. yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's called iCloud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me sort of back it up away from mobile for a minute, um, back to the larger sort of threat. You know, 66% of corporate breaches go months, if not longer, undetected, which seems ridiculously absurd in this day and era. Why do you think that is? Um, Maybe. I can Joseph or John? John? Can, John's even better than me. I mean, I can just tell you, having run a security company before joining Greylock, the, thing, the mantra I always tell people about security is it's a journey. It's not a destination. And I think this assumption that you're ever going to solve it mm -hmm. is it's just a myth. You're never going to get there. And I think the thing is you're constantly just trying to run faster than the people trying to perpetrate, most of the time, some sort of crime. You're either trying to steal money or steal ideas for a corporation. And now we're dealing with it at a nation state level. And so I think the challenge is that, um, um, like in many cases, just like with crimes, I mean, there's tons of crimes that go unsolved in the physical world, not cybersecurity related things. Um, you just, we just need more people, better trained people. We have a huge problem. We can't even probably, John probably is trying to hire you know, more people than he can and his team at Cisco to, to deal with these p issues. We have a sort of an education challenge in terms of trying to find really smart people that actually want to help protect, and that's, that's a hard thing to keep up with. To, a lot, to some extent, I would probably agree with you, but even the most basic of you know, consumer individual tasks, like email, for instance, mm -hmm. remain pretty insecure or unsecure. You know, what more can be done in that respect? Well, I think the, the other challenge is that um, convenience always trumps security. Mm -hmm. um, how many people here have a passcode on their phone? How many people don't? <laughs> is that par for the course? How many? It, it, <laughs> it's, it's, and actually, you're, you're, you're actually like unusual in this group. There's usually more of people like you because people, they don't really think about it. And it's just like it's a nuisance. And so until you start to change people's sort of behaviors, and that's the hardest thing in the world to do, mm -hmm. Um, it's not always just a technical solution. It's actually people. And if you look at a lot of the ways that people get into organizations, it's usually not initially through some sort of technical problem. It's usually through some people problem where they figure out how to get in, they get someone's password, they, and they get in, and then, and then they do a lot of damage. And I, I don't, you know, that's, that's a really hard problem um, to solve that sort of people training education. But and I'm sure John has even more horror stories than I do. I mean, John, I'd love to briefly hear, because I think we have talked in the past about creating sort of security experiences that, A, are, are great for the user, keep, you know, keep them safe, but also um, to Joseph's 
sort of point. You know, many people don't like to use their, don't like to have a, a password because it's a barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, maybe you can talk a little about sort of what you guys are doing or, or ways, you know, ways to reduce friction. It's. I think th we we're seeing this really interesting shift, and it actually translates well with the computing shift to the post PC era. Whereas, when you think about security. No one really wants security, right? And again, you don't meet a lot of people like, oh, I'm so psyched I have Norton. I'm going to go tell everyone I know about this. This is great. <laughs> like, they don't. And in fact, it's usually the thing that's a nuisance and slows your computer down, is trying to scare you, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the solutions in the PC era were kind of forced down upon users and created friction and challenging experiences. And in most cases, the answer to that was either uh, annoyance or not using it, choosing not to use it. And as we move into the post-PC era, so you know, cloud computing using more of the web-based applications as well as mobile, user choice and user experience is becoming kind of the order of battle. You see this even in enterprise applications. The need for great design and user experience is important. And so when we think about it, you know, this is on, on Joseph's point, security is a design and user experience problem. If we are to solve the problem, we need to do so in such a way that it's completely seamless and transparent mm -hmm. and the user doesn't have to think about it. If that happens, the, 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 the net difference is none. Mm -hmm. And do people need security? Yes, of course they'll use it if it's designed into the experience. So a great example of this, device theft is a really big problem. We just launched a feature called LockCam where a user really doesn't have to do anything. It's built in the experience. And if you were to steal my phone and mistype the password three times, it'll take a front-facing photo of you, email me, and say, this person just tried to steal your phone with a picture of you which is fantastic, the user had to do nothing, adds huge amounts of value, and there's this really interesting positive reinforcement loop that you know, when they see this happen, usually people are laughing because it's, it's just you know, something random, like their significant other or their child who like, accidentally took a photo of them, but like, wow, you know, the security functionality is there for me, and I didn't have to think about it. How many users does uh, Lookout have now? Uh, over 40 million. And um, how many users are using that feature? I know it's new. Over half, I mean, a significant portion. Um, another sort of big catchphrase that's sort of uh, pervading a lot of people's minds these days is the idea of the Internet of Things, right? That increasingly more and more of our personal devices are Internet connected, whether or not it's our Nest thermostat or um, for a lucky tens of thousands, a Tesla Model, model S. Um, you know, to that end, I mean, how susceptible are devices like those? And should we be currently worried? I would be paranoid as heck right about now. <laughs> so imagine this, a denial of service attack from the Brazilian rainforest. And if you think that's actually not possible, it's actually being enabled through the fact that they're putting censoring in order to measure oxygenation levels across and decimation levels of the Brazilian forest right through low, low voltage, self-generated IP addressable devices. No people involved. I mean, I think about what John talks about, and it's all around, you know, user experience has got to be seamless. And I'm thinking in my house, there's 134 IP addresses right now, of which there are a whole bunch of them that have nothing to do with people. And interestingly enough, in most of the designs of these architectures, you've got static operating systems. They're not field programmable, they're not field replaceable, not field upgradable. And even if they were, there's no financial incentive to go about doing it. And so we're investing in things like in my home uh, state with California, with PG&E, they're investing in technology that essentially is stagnant that's sitting on the side of my house that's going to be my power bill base and my gas utilization base. Already has vulnerabilities by the time it's shipped. Already has exploitable vulnerabilities that have been proven. Can manipulate the data and there is no intent whatsoever from PG&E to do anything about it because they would have to go to each and every house. So there's, if, if you think about what we're making, this is self-inflicted. A hundred percent of this is self-inflicted. How so? We, we, sorry? How so? Well, we all don't want security because it's a hassle. Mm. So that's a self-inflicted result. We all don't want or care really honestly about what the, uh, the vendors are doing enough to ask. That's a differentiation purchasing decision. Uh, we rarely even have the knowledge on how to question, you know, does Xbox actually do auto update across my broadband in order to make sure that the software there is not going to be turning the, the uh, controller and the camera on my, uh, my television in order to make sure that I'm being snooped out of my house. My Samsung television, I'll give you a sense of this. My Samsung television is updating twice a day right now. And I think about this and go, how many, how many things went wrong in their programming environment that I'm getting software <laughs> downloads twice a day? And I have to think to myself, what are they doing? And I honestly couldn't tell you from that user experience whether or not it's Samsung upgrading it 
or John's actually figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have no idea. So, so this is, you know, our future actually, I think in, in the number one area around threat, JP, is we now have essentially uh, somewhere in the north starting in about 2008 of more IP addressable online devices that are available at any given minute than we have people on the earth. 2008 is when we cross that barrier. There's an expectation by 2020 there's going to be something like six to eight times the number of people on the earth, number of devices on the internet that have connectivity in a reasonably close approximation of what the, the forward-looking track looks like. Now think about user experience from the non-people part. How in the heck, with that many programmers, with that many software instantiations, with that many vendors, is it going to be anything else other than service providers that are going to save us? Because they're the only concentration of power that in the connectivity tissue of the internet is going to frankly know if Samsung's upgraded correctly, Sony's upgraded correctly, Tesla's car's upgraded correctly, all the phones are upgraded correctly, et cetera. So are you basically saying that like, you know, my, my personal device set up at home or so forth, um, there are no outside, besides the ISPs, there, there, what solutions are there? I mean. I don't know of another one where there can be a solution because you're looking forced to majority in order to yeah. affect something of that scale. So, so John, are you telling me that I have to rely on Comcast for my home security? <laughs> no, I'm saying you better rely on yourself. For your <laughs> now you, you really think, got me scared. But the, you know, the well, where do you do it at scale? That's, right. that's the, I, I don't mind having a different answer. I'm fully willing to be wrong. They always have been. But give me another answer on that very point about Internet of Everything concept. Yeah. But, that but frankly the gets bit that I'm excited about Internet of Everything is IPv6 finally gets an excuse to exist. Break that so, down. so, I mean, we've exhausted our IPv4 addresses. There's not enough IP addresses for all of this stuff. And unless we want to run a bunch of carrier grade NAT, which totally I'm very adamantly against because it wrecks a lot of things, we're going to have to go to IPv6. And that's great. Now you can I address everything in the planet forever. And so I use that as like, well, if we're going to go to the Internet of Everything, just please upgrade to IPv6. Jeff, can you break that down to me? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tech writer, but I'm yeah. also um, a lazy tech person, and I'm, yeah. a, I'm a Luddite. So. Yeah. I don't quite know what IPv6 is. So, so there's essentially, the internet's going through this, the first time it's had a major upgrade in 30 years, since it was created essentially. And we're changing the way that addresses are handed out. Currently the model is IPv4 in North America. Other parts of Asia, they've already run out of these addresses. Mm. Um, so they're already using the next generation of addressing called IPv6. Parts of Africa, they have such low density, they've gotten, uh, they have enough IPv4 addresses to last the next two or three years. But in the States, we've just recently run out. And that means you have very limited options if you want to connect your refrigerator. You either reuse an existing IP address, you get a new address, like, or, you, uh, or you, you hide it, you, you multiplex it. And what we're dealing with now is the world IPv6 day, Google's gone to IPv6, Facebook has an IPv6. We're starting to see adoption, maybe only 8% adoption now, but 10 years from now, the world will be IPv6. And this Internet of Everything is going to accelerate it, I believe, because it's the only way in which you can address every device on the planet and have plenty of room to spare. So if my TV wants to talk to your toaster, which wants to talk to somebody in the other side of the planet, we can actually all share IP addresses and be addressable, which is going to enable a whole other class of business that we haven't even thought of yet. Jeff, how do you see that helping security, though? Well, that's, I'm not saying it's great for security. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm you, saying, saying, right. you said you were thrilled about I'm, that possibility. I thought I'm that might have been something I'm just thrilled that it's an it. excuse to get V6 out there. Oh, all right. Okay, yeah. but, but to John's point, that also seems like it would introduce another set of potential problems. Oh, yeah, it would be great. Yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, there's some phenomenal It's the uh, Security Guy Full forward. Employment Act, V6. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it'll keep our industry running for a while but, because, but, you know, number one, most of the... The practices that have been used for the last 20 odd years um, that certainly I've been involved in are going to break. You can't mm -hmm. do enumeration of all your networks. You can't essentially do cross tying to DHCP per time per machine in order to get a real true clue as to the user because you can do refresh rates that are much faster. It, there's some really basic technology that isn't even V6 capable today. But and that will give you an excuse in. to sell all new CPE and all new router equipment to V6 now. So well, Hey, I'm with you. I just I said from a security yeah, yeah. standpoint. Well, it'll be interesting, <laughs> though, because it's going to force a refresh on all of our equipment that we've been sitting around for a decade. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to get new stuff to do V6. Any problems? Um, Save but, up money now, I guess. Yeah. Well, let, let's look a little farther ahead. Um, two of the people on this panel, I think we're lucky to have our... Um, are either currently hackers or or have re retired hackers. 
Um, and when we think about hackers, we think about you know, free information. They have a certain sort of mantra or mission. Um, what does the future of the hacker look like? Want to yeah. kick that off? Yeah, so, so let me start by at least giving how I, what the definition of hacker means to me. Okay. So uh, when I think about a hacker, it's someone who's inherently curious about how systems work, whatever system that may be. Uh, it could be a human system, it could be social interactions, it could be a technical system. In, in the case of this, it's a technical system. And that person does something with that system that the creator of the system couldn't have imagined or intended or didn't think was possible. That's, that's what I think of as a hacker. And how I got into to this as a kid was I you know, was exposed to computing and programming at a really early age in the internet and just was curious. And at the point in time when I started doing this, machines didn't really do a lot. You had to learn how they worked, how networking worked to actually do this. And, and a lot of it started within a community. Mm -hmm. And in fact, like my company probably wouldn't exist if it hadn't have been for the conference that Jeff started, which is called DEF CON. Right. You know, I've been going for over a decade. And it's and the it biggest hacker conference, conference in the world. And, yeah. what, and so to answer your question, how does that change? You know, I've been going for over a decade and I'm still pretty young, but I look at people who are like 18, 19 who are starting to go now, and they're not that different. And when I say that, they're passionate, inherently curious, really, really nerdy, and they're spending a lot of time focusing on different types of problems. That's the way we used to look at you, John. <laughs> <laughs> still do sometimes. Because you're, I still have you're, to, unfortunately, because right? you're and not getting any older. 30. Yeah. And the, uh, the, t the technology has shifted, no doubt. So you look at, uh, like, when we first, like, look out, when we first started presenting on mobile, we were one of the first to do anything related to mobile. Mm -hmm. Our friend from England, Adam Laurie, a few other people, but, but no, and now everyone's talking about mobile. You look at internet of everything, there's a lot of trends, and what I always look for mm -hmm. at Jeff's conference in particular is like the one or two talks that are on the edge that are super interesting that I know five years from now are gonna yeah. be really important. So I don't think the hackers have changed. The technology is changing and shifting. Now the one other thing that really has changed is the implications mm -hmm. of what we do on a global level. And when I say that, like we're at a world where everything is so connected and so many things are coming online. People actually care about this now. This is not just some fringe thing. And when I say that, if you look at the, the people who come to DEF CON, at first it started just us and our peers. We're at a world today where the most important people in the government, for example, in corporations, you know, are coming to be, have access to what's going on at the bleeding edge, and that's changed a lot over the last decade, in my opinion. Yeah. Jeff, I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, I would say in the early days, hackers, it was all about getting your hands on the information. So you'd break into a university to get access to the manual pages to figure out how to use the computer you just broke into. Because there was no Amazon or Google or anything. You couldn't, you'd spend all your time trying to find the guy that understood the system. Nowadays, it's the opposite, right? Information is everywhere. It's, it's limitless. If you want to understand how to hack Java, there's 50 free courses online. If you want to understand how to hack Ruby, there's 20 things to talk about. So the problem is now an abundance of information. So the hacker nowadays is actually, instead of self-directed, it's like you, could, you have to specialize as a hacker. Mm. But there's so much you can specialize in now, it's a little overwhelming. Mm. And so what we have to do is give people general ways to get interested in security and let them specialize because otherwise it's like, oh, you want to be a, you want to be a heart doctor. Okay, well, here's the scalpel and there's the patient. You know? No, you need a, a way to, to get them up to a certain level. And I'm a little concerned that um, a lot of it is very inaccessible. It's so complex. Our industry is specialized. Uh, you, you specialize to get uh, competence and, and to distinguish yourself in the, in the career. We used to joke, you could get four guys in a room. You'd have a Unix guy, a phone guy, you know, maybe a hacker, a phone freaker, and four guys could really pretty much take over the American phone system, like four guys. <laughs> Nowadays, I need a room twice as big just to understand what's going on with SQL injection or something. I mean, we've, we've made it so complex that it's now beyond any one person's brain to understand. And so that's why I like inspiring the hackers to, to find an angle and look at the future because the, um, the world is our oyster. We just talk about the internet of everything. I mean, who's going to be hacking on John's power meter? We need people to look at this stuff, right? I'm going right? to be hacking on my You're power meter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I'm seeing is people with these hacking skills, they start off and instead of traditionally they'd go into sort of like IT, now they're going into maybe law or policy yep. or they're doing other things. Or uh, a startup. Right, or Mobile startup. Now startup. there's some business around it. Mm. And or, so or, they're or, the, or, the, or worse, the military. Or, and yeah. that's the thing that scares me the most, actually, is like what's happening with nation states and how they're using cybersecurity as an offensive tool 
that's that's something we haven't really thought about. No, in the right into that point, you know, five years ago, I could talk to governments, or if they would listen, and they're like, "Internet, what?" For policy nowadays, they have all woken up, and now they're interested in internet governance and who controls what and who's in charge, mm -hmm. and the the the, the, na the nature of the discussion, the discourse is now changing fundamentally. We're starting to see more and more attempts at legislation out of Congress. Sooner or later, they'll succeed. I don't know if that's good or bad, but. We'll get something coming out Once of Congress. Once we read it, we'll know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> one of the scariest things to the point that Joseph's brought up that I don't think the world really appreciates is, you know, the, the use of cyber weapons, if you will, may or may not be used at a greater scale as time goes on. It's trending in that direction. But the collateral damage is the users and businesses on the Internet. And in a world where... Uh, attribution is extremely difficult, mm -hmm. uh, meaning it's hard to say who perpetuated an attack. And the cost uh, of very bespoke attacks is high. However, governments have basically infinite resources. We get into this world that people become so afraid of one another in order to, to, to deal with that problem, people seek attribution. And in the course of doing that, lobby or you know, use, use influence of governments to change the architecture of the internet. Yeah. And that's 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 when you're already world. seeing that. Yeah, we're yeah. already starting to see that. So yeah. literally the way the internet works may change and and to the detriment of a lot of us who build businesses on the internet. Because the security is not there to give right. assurance. So yeah. JP, the, the role of the hacker is gonna be a villain or a hero. I mean it's nothing's gonna change in the foundational element of how a person's reviewed. And candidly, there's not gonna be a single opinion on any given person. Some will actually suggest that the person did something right. Some will suggest that the impact of what they did was wrong. Mm -hmm. And we'll have this philosophical debate about it, just like we have philosophical debates about differences in culture for the rest of our times. I think the, the part that John just brought up, though, and can't be underestimated, is um, what was the reason they did it? You know, intellectual curiosity at 18 is very different than a national projection of power. Mm -hmm. um, destroying by accident is very different than destroying by intent. Maliciously. Um, and I had, my, my worry, frankly, of our industry has been increasingly that where it used to be we would break into each other's systems purely to learn, and that was what we intended to do always, and we enjoyed it, and that's how we actually got into the whole thing. I never want to see that lost. And I would, I would hate to actually see a, a, a counter effect start showing up saying, no, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, because candidly, it's not. It's actually increasingly helpful. So part of the hero part of this is um, finding vulnerabilities from systems can be done by just about anybody. And, and if the fact that you find one and it turns out to be a software issue that none of us would have ever thought imagined or otherwise in that role, then frankly, vendors ought to be able to take advantage of it and, and use that as a helpful thing, not as a harmful thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where the adversarial role between vendors and hackers should never exist. Yeah. So just yeah. one, one concrete example yeah. on that really quickly. So give a quick shout out to Google. So Google just shipped Google Glass for anyone who's seen it. This is a wearable computing system, which is interesting around the internet of everything trend. And there's, I don't know what the exact number is, but there's a very small number of them out there. I think less than 10,000 right now. And they have this thing called the Explorers program. And they actually gave us a bunch for the sole and purpose of us hacking these devices. It was awesome. And you did. Yeah, you we found, it. yeah, we talked about it last week. We found a zero day exploit in it that if you look at a QR code, we can actually own, all you have to do is look at the QR code and we'll exploit <laughs> your Google Glass and take control of it. It's super rad. And we talked to Google and they patched the vulnerability. They got on top of it. And this was the whole point. And like, Google has embraced that in a super positive way, and their products are going to be better because of it, mm -hmm. and the community respects them yeah. because of it. So it's a perfect and, example. And, and, if, yeah. and I think the, the key thing, I think, is to figure out how to harness that creativity. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that, right? You'll see, I think Google's done this where they give prizes to people to try to find vulnerabilities. We're actually yeah. seeing startups being created where they're actually trying to basically crowdsource people help and, giving, and basically make it financially viable to actually hack into it, products to help. Oh. And, and I think if you stop making it adversarial and you try to make it where, hey, we're on the same team, we're trying to solve these same problems, I think you can actually see better security as a result. Cool. Well, let me, um, and our time is a little bit crunched, so I want to open up the floor a bit to people in the audience. Certainly there are a lot of companies here with whom security is a concern, whether it's something like Eventbrite um, or elsewhere. Um, anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, Mark Anderson, I represent Invent IP which uh, is focused on nation-sponsored theft of crown jewel IP. We think this is a really, really, really big problem. And uh, you were asking about trends at the beginning of your conversation. The one trend that we've seen in the nation-sponsored world is a move away from, a few years ago it was only corporations, big corporations, get the, get the secret sauce. 
they've gotten a bit better at protection and they've moved into the supply chain into SMBs, into small, medium-sized businesses, because they can't afford the same level of protection usually. And so it's, it's a way of going up, upstream to get the same secret sauce before it gets there. And they've now, just about a year ago, started the next wave of that, which is go to the universities before it even gets to the SMBs. So before it even goes into a startup, they're already at the university level trying to get that IP. And universities are specifically, culturally, against that, against protecting data. And so my question is, have you guys seen this shift toward stealing university IP by nations? And if so, is there anything that you would recommend in terms of solving that problem? I think there's a difference between universities being against uh, stealing data and sh being open and sharing data. I would argue, I disagree with you, I think universities love sharing data. I think if you went and asked any university, research university, how do you feel about some nation state stealing this information and using it? maliciously, they wouldn't feel good about it. So I can't speak specifically to what we've seen, but I think that, you know, I know a bunch of CSOs at universities, they're, they're no slouches, they're pretty sharp people, and they look at their network like any other enterprise would, and are spending money just like any other enterprise would to defend it. Where there's value, there's theft. QED, doesn't matter who's doing it, doesn't matter why it's being done, um, where there's value, there's theft. And, you know, the, frankly, there's no one condition in which, you know, we call it nation state, but then you have to ask yourself, first of all, which one, what's their capability, you know, what's their ultimate goal, are they doing it for themselves, are they doing it for others? Um, and, you know, it, it seems to get lost in the discussion that, you know, in the end of this, part of the reason this is legitimately happening, and I say legitimately because there are no literal rules uh, that have been codified that are understood by at least over 100 countries, um, is that the lack of leadership, frankly, at, say, something like the G20 or the G8, uh, World Economic Forum or the Council of Nations, you name it, Council of Europe, the Asia-Pacific Rim, whatever, um, we haven't nailed down what's right and what's wrong. I mean, we end up seeing it's something wrong. i got to tell you, I've met 16-year-old hackers in Eastern Europe that hit Cisco pretty good, and the only reason they were doing it, because I flat out was curious, was they said, well, I've got to provide food for my family, and this is the only job available. Now, do I, I look at that at wrong in one level, and I look at also at wrong at another level. It just depends on what optic I'm staring at. And at the same time, you look at a nation, and you go, well, part of the reason they might be doing is not to steal a crown jewels for crown jewels sake to enable a complementary or competitive enterprise, but because it's in their best interest to know whether or not the technology that's sitting in their infrastructure that's built from somewhere else is not actually acting on behalf of another country. Now, that's a national security matter. Guess what? That's exactly what a nation is supposed to do. They're supposed to protect their own. Do I like it? No. Victim. So it's not as if it's an easy thing to deal with. But this is not going to go away. It's going to go only to a place when there are rules that say, this is right, this is wrong. I'm stealing it for commercial gain or I'm stealing it for national security gain, which are very different. Um, and this is going to take more time than, frankly, all of us are going to probably be in this industry because at the moment, no one's leading. That's what I mean. Consistently. I, I'm not saying it doesn't exist in certain places. Um, but it, the, the best part, I'll give you examples of this. I know of companies that I have sat down with that literally said they wanted to buy all the security technology that Cisco could build. And they wanted to protect their intellectual property. And I flat out asked, said, what are you worried about? And they said, well, I stole the technology to start my company. I improved it. And now I want to make sure the guy that I stole it from doesn't steal it back. And that's a straight up conversation I've been sitting right on the other side of the table with. Because in that particular country, it was considered normal. You had Where a question. there's value, there's theft. Sorry, you had a question. Chris Kemp. Chris Kemp, CEO of Nebula. Uh, before I did this, I was a CTO of NASA, where I know a lot about um, things that are mostly classified uh, that uh, you guys have inferred. As, as enterprises that take three to four months to even find that they've been compromised start moving more of their infrastructure to the cloud, mm -hmm. where a lot of this has been, you know, it's been abstracted away. Obviously, the cloud service provider can handle some aspects of security, but, you know, what do you guys think of uh, enterprises using more and more public cloud services and, and how that will affect their security posture in the future? My, the first thing I tell people with cloud is just understand you have no Fourth Amendment protection, right? Just getting in the door, you've got no Fourth Amendment and if you're cool with that, continue you know, your journey further. Um, and at ICANN, we use some software as a service, some SaaS providers, some cloud providers. And it's fascinating talking to the vendors about this. So you're like, so who do I call at midnight if I think there's a problem? 
Um, well, we're only 20, you know, we're only during normal office hours. I'm like, if you're broken into, will you tell me? Oh, we've never been broken into. Hmm. Do you know if you'd be broken yeah. into? Right. I mean, <laughs> in three just, months from so now, I've will got you like know a if simple you'd be one into? page checklist. <laughs> and the further you go down that list, it's sort of like a litmus test, right? The further down, it's like, how many, can you give me an outline of the last security audit you've had? What, you know, best practices do you follow for your secure software development life cycle? You don't, you're not going to like the answers you get. I have a friend who works in one of these huge cloud providers that we all understand. And he said, I moved to this job from the small rinky-dink SMB thinking I was going to be at like, you know, Google and they're going to give me great lunches and they're going to have the best gear. And he's like, I'm upgrading switches that have not had software upgrades in eight years. I mean, the infrastructure is stuck together with duct tape and bailing wire and we're cloud. And like, we're the shiny future of the world. And it's like, no, we're just as bad as any other SMB. We just have a different label on our door. It's like, oh, you know, you're not making me feel good here, guy. Uh, There's you guys. Oh, yeah. One more question, yes. RTGS leader of uh, Synopsys. Uh, no matter how many protections you put around your IP, sooner or later you discover that actually the weakest link is your own employees. Mm -hmm. and, and there, of course, uh, it's always after the fact. So you can start putting in a variety of checkers on what happens on the boundary and so on. We really discovered that, uh, especially with some of the things happening in the press around Snowden, uh, Europe is now becoming very strongly adverse to uh, any form of checking because it is invading the privacy of your employees on your own equipment, on your own IP, by the way. And so we, we concluded that we, in some cases, cannot even check if they're doing something in the world. We can try to stop the IP from moving at that point in time, but we cannot check on them and tell them stop, stop doing this. Get new legal department. You mentioned the fact that, that legislation in multiple countries can be absolutely essential. But if, if you buy into the fact that employees work at your company on your IP with your equipment in countries where you cannot enforce that they don't steal through you, I don't know how banks keep their money in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. As unfortunately, I had to cut this short. Um, please feel free to continue the, continue the conversation afterwards. Um, you have 10 minutes to, to uh, get to your next session, but I wanted to thank these guys for taking the time and to uh, lend their insight.